Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible together out loud, chapter by chapter, looking at 2 Samuel chapter 15 today. Really enjoyed the conversation yesterday, just all these different characters, and things just really got set in motion. Things are moving, and yeah, we saw towards the end, you know, it was just, it's just sad, right? At the end of 14, you have what looks like maybe an olive branch, some kind of hope for reconciliation. Uh, you know, Absalom's able to go back into David's presence. David kisses him. But then we get chapter 15, Absalom's conspiracy. So big chapter here. Uh, I think a lot of interesting things to talk about today. We got joining us as our guest, got Pastor Brian Thiem, pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Columbia, Missouri. Good morning, brother. Welcome. Good to have you with us and looking at this chapter today. Good morning. It's good to be here. Yes, using using the terms with us and here in the you know, kind of lo- <laughs> loose sense, you know. <laughs> but but in uh, more well, it's like sense, the twenty twenty yeah. sense, yes. Well, but you know, it's it's like even even like what Paul said, right, when he was talking, uh, well, well, writing his letter to the Corinthians, right? You know, uh, present in spirit, although absent in body, right? There we go. There you go. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, you know, the story of Absalom, it's um. And, and just the role that Absalom plays. I mean, we, we've just been seeing it. it. It's it's really big in Second Samuel and in, in in the Psalms, right? All connected to everything that happened with Bathsheba. Uh, we'll also have to uh, think about uh, Bathsheba again this chapter. Uh, even, even though maybe it's not, I don't know, included in your standard set of Sunday school stories. Uh, pretty big though. Absolutely, this one chapter has a lot to offer us, a lot to see. And as it pertains to God's word and interaction of God's people and in this fallen world. So I really thought you were going to go for Absalom Lutely right there, but it's okay. Yeah, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, just let, just, just let me follow my sword like that. It's okay. <laughs> but <clears throat> anyways, enough uh, goofy illusions here. Uh, as we turn to the chapter, brother, would you get us started with a word of prayer? Certainly, and if you don't mind, I will go ahead and pray the prayer that's already been written for this chapter. And that prayer is actually Psalm 3. There you go. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of my many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Amen. Amen. I really, I actually, uh, I really like Psalm 3. It's the the psalm that my daughter and I uh, chant together uh, in the mornings, and then Psalm 4, uh, the one in the evenings. Uh, just just great psalms in general. But yeah, you're right, though. Uh, very specific, actually, as well, um, even according to their superscriptions to everything going on with, uh, with Absalom. Yeah, this uh, particular one was, as it says, written for when David had fled from Absalom, his son. And so I thought it was very fitting. It's also the first of the Lament Psalms, which we may get into a little later on that one. It's uh, it's beautiful the way it wraps around with the Lord and him being our shield, the one who lifts our head, the one who sustains us, the one whose salvation belongs, and the a blessing for his people. And, and, and I think also um, it's, a, it's a psalm that I think it feels very timely too as well, just everything going on, um, <laughs> the opening line, how many, right? Um, yeah, but, you know, it's interesting though too, right? Like in our times, uh, you know, the, the, the bit at the end of the prayer, the, the striking on the cheek and the breaking the teeth, right? Um, 
<laughs> that was that was one where I had to like work on kind of curbing my four year old's enthusiasm, right? <laughs> like, so there you okay, go. baby, <laughs> okay, baby. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not, you know, you know I we think what is, absolutely, and I think what is beautiful about this psalm, like I said, it's one of the psalms of lament, and um, a lot of times laments. Sometimes I like to translate those as uh, psalms of deep pain or deep sorrow. Mm-hmm. And so many are written that way when, when, as we will see, David suffers from the hands of his son. Yeah. And when we do suffer sin, how those psalms of lament are meant for us. You see this in Psalm 3, Psalm 13. There, there's uh, many, many psalms, both individual and corporate, that are lament psalms. And in fact, it's one of the one of the things about that helps us understand. That you probably covered a couple chapters ago with Tamar, and what happened to her, and and what is it that we as Christians? How do you speak to Tamar if you meet someone like that? And the Psalms of Lament are those Psalms meant for those deep times of pain and sorrow. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, well, I hope I hope we actually have a chance to to maybe look at uh, Psalm three, but. Um, It'd be very, it'd be very easy to to spend the whole time just talking about that one, <laughs> but um, that is a good point that you were just making about the deep sorrow. I think that reminds us about chapter fourteen, how Joab saw that even though David was uh, obviously grieving um, the death of Amnon, and y- you can tell, like you know, hey, he's my, my son Absalom has done something terrible, and he he shouldn't be able to just walk back into Jerusalem like nothing happened, right? So there's a, there's a thing about justice, but in the previous chapter, Job could tell that you know he he didn't um, he didn't want to disown his son. He didn't want it, his son to be destroyed, and and, uh, and 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 you see that elsewhere too. So I think that kind of the, the deep pain you were speaking of that plays into what we see in chapter 15. Anything else, uh, briefly, in terms of context or things that kind of tie into this to keep in mind before we read the chapter through? As as far as, I mean, when we look at this, we remember who Absalom is, which I, you've been mm-hmm. dealing with him as that third son. And, uh, but his, na- his name itself, which is kind of ironic, because mm-hmm. it has the understanding of father's peace or the peace of the father. And that's anything but in this coming chapter that we're having, that's coming up. And I think yeah. also with keeping that in mind, some of the other things we're going to want to watch out for is some of the other players that are in this, such as Ephol, who ends up being, as some had said, Rasheba's grandfather and how that plays out. But also, um, I think we don't want to miss where these things take place, such as Hebron, Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives, and how that can guide us in our understanding or, or bring out more meaning or understanding of what's happening here. In the fifteenth chapter, yeah, that that's a uh, no, that, that, that's that's a good point. All, all these places, right? They're they're places. Uh, they're not the first time that we've heard about these places, and they certainly won't be the last. Uh, but let's go ahead then, and we'll just uh, put the chapter down before us here. We got chapter fifteen in Second Samuel in the English Standard Version. After this, Absalom got himself a chariot and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow that I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I lived at Geshur and Aram, saying, If the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, 
Absalom is king at Hebron. When Absalom went 200, with Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, and they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. And a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever the Lord, the king, decides. So the king went out and all his household after him. And the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him. And they halted at the last house. And all his servants passed by him and all the Carathites and the Pelathites and all the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath passed on before the king. Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why do you also go with us? Go back and stay with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your home. You came only yesterday, and I shall I today make you wander about with us, since I go I know not where? Go back and take your brothers with you, and may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. But Ittai, the, Ittai answered the king, As the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, There also will be your servant. And David said to Ittai, Go then, pass on. So Ittai the Gittite passed on with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. And all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by. And the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with all the Levites, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am, and let him do to me what seems good to him. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your two sons, Ahimaaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. And it was told David... Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. While David was coming to the summit, where God was worshipped, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him, with his coat torn and dirt on his head. David said to him, If you go on with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so now I will be your servant, then you will defeat for me the counsel of Ahithophel. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priests with you there? So whatever you hear from the king's house, tell to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son, and by them you shall send to me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city just as Absalom was entering Jerusalem. So, uh, yeah, again, right, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of these minor characters, and, you know, it's just, I think it's really interesting, the combination, I think, you see in David of both showing personal concern, right? I mean, there's, a, there's a, you know, he's talking to Ittai, right, who's uh, not from there. He's thinking to himself, you know, I'm, is this path, this journey really going to be any good for him? Uh, telling him to to stay back, uh, just out of concern. And then you know when, when he's talking here to, uh, I mean it's, it's Hushai, right? Um, he's saying, hey, you know, why don't you go and be a mole, <laughs> right on, on the on the inside? So I mean a combination of 
prudence and also compassion, right? Yeah, we we can see that. We can see that in the palace intrigue, as they would say. And yeah. uh, we, we can certainly see David playing both parts, um, one to a foreigner and one to who's uh, part of the people, which is mm-hmm. interesting. That Yeah, no, that's right. Um, it's it's a very mixed bunch, right? And, um, and I think it's we actually referenced this chapter earlier when we were looking uh, – I, I just, it's just kind of the nature of that, right? Where, where is it? It was um, back. There you go. In verse 18, right? And all his servants passed by him, all the Carathites, all the Pelathites, and all the 600 Gittites. So, I mean, it, it is uh, just interesting. It's one of the little details that just shows you how eclectic a bunch, right, David kept around him and uh, how previously— I mean, it really spoke to, to David's uh, kind of overwhelming popularity, popular among not only the 12 tribes of Israel, but, um, I mean, the, the surrounding nations, right, in, in different ways. But, yeah, I, I mean, you, you just see it in the, in the first chapter, right? This is, the, this is the big thing. Absalom, just right under David's nose, uh, undermines his authority and rule and steals the people's hearts, right? I mean, he, he just wins over... Uh, the people in this popularity contest that he starts. I think that uh, if if we look at that, and especially the ones that leave, is throughout David, you find enemies becoming friends, friends becoming enemies. Mm-hmm. We find uh, what's interesting is that when he does leave, he's leaving with foreigners and not with those who are in the house of God. And the ones who are part of the house are the ones that are now causing and usurping uh, and going against the authorities that God has given. And we'll see that in the New Testament, too, and throughout the New Testament. Uh, Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we're throughout the uh, New Testament, we see the uh, foreigners, and I think you even mentioned this yesterday, the day before, about the foreigner, the foreign woman who comes and mm-hmm. is included, even right. among the scraps. That's right. But the people who belong, such as the Pharisees and that, are the ones who rebel, which is a sad state. But yeah, that's right. Going back to Absalom, and in probably the important part that I can see here in that first part is we see the the fourth commandment in in Absalom breaking that fourth commandment in several ways. One as his father and one as his king. That uh, who has who has given that authority and that's been God who's given authority both to the father and to the king. And so we see Absalom not just trying to usurp, usurp authority against David, his father king, but in actuality acting against God. And, and it's it's really interesting too because I think um, th- that point you're just making is really highlighted in the text um, be- because we have just I mean so, such a a contrast right you have you know I mean here's Absalom right who's who's killed a man and he gets welcomed back right I mean just think about that you know uh, Moses uh, runs away uh, you know because he's killed somebody and you know he thinks he can't come back. Um, but but here, look, uh, Absalom gets to, to come back, and, and the king kisses him, right? Uh, again, that that uh, that peace, right? I mean, that that, that is his name, right? Uh, you know, the, the father's peace. So he has his father's peace extended to him mercifully um, in forgiveness, right? Uh, but then, how does he repay him? Uh, <laughs> next thing he's doing is he's getting chariots and horses and starts doing this. And it's not like he does it the next day. Um, you know, the Hebrew construction there that gets translated in the ESV is after this. We've seen it before. It means kind of like some time after this. But I, I think uh, it's just to make the point you were just articulating that by kind of skipping ahead to this now, it just shows just, wow, so this is how Absalom is going to repay his father? Yeah, and, I, and, you know, and to be fair, I probably in one sense is that you have Absalom is repaying his father, but he's seen the misbehavior of his father throughout this whole thing. So it's not like 
what we pass on to our children is very important. Is it yeah. the Swedes, one of them that says, be careful, or how's it, children are like cement. Um, if you drop something on them, it would leave an impression. So it makes you wonder <laughs> how much of an impression has been left yeah. on, on Absalom, besides yeah. his own character in this whole thing. Yes. But he does repay, and it, I think it was about two years, and then we'll see that it was another four years, so this whole six, th- six years of this going on, some of this, these things taking place. Um, if I remember right, that's the way that works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that's right. No, it's, it's not as if you've got, you know, in, innocent David and, uh, you know, just, oh, bad apple, you know, um, Absalom or something like that. We talked about that, of course. Um, I mean, really, uh, the last two chapters, just about how, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, everything that's going on here, um, it, it traces its way back to David in many ways. The bad example that he set, the the sword that he brought upon his own house. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about, you know, so what he's actually doing here, um, you know, because you're right, he's he's usurping. He's not just he's not just ungratefully. Um, Paying back his his father's kindness with evil, yeah, that's, that's 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 certainly part of it, but also in that sense of the fourth commandment too. I mean, he really is undermining his authority, right, and stepping in um, to his shoes where where he shouldn't be. And then um, I, I I don't recall. Did you mention the eighth commandment also? I mean, he's also just lying, right? Right, and, right, right. And and, uh, and and just kind of slandering him here, right? Because so so you got this, right? We got to remind ourselves, you know, he's if he's there sitting in in, in the gate, right? You know, this is where people go to to settle disputes right and so this is this is so tricky because he just says uh hang on a second what what city are you from and and so this is like you know this is just like when someone comes up to you with like a clipboard and you know like a an official looking you know uh, garb right and starts asking you a question like that you're like oh and you know <laughs> so so they're like you know well i'm from the tribe of Issachar. he's like oh Issachar. yeah well you know and, and he gives them the update right too, too bad David actually, you know, doesn't have really have anything for you here, but I can step in. I mean, it's, it, it's just, it's just so, ah, just so underhanded, right? Yeah. I mean, we can look at the whole thing and I think that's right. We, we have Absalom, which you had talked about in the earlier chapter. He's very, he's a very ham- handsome fellow. Um, there's no blemish on him from head to toe. He apparently has long hair mm-hmm. and he stands there and, and the way it speaks about him standing there, he knows that many kings sit at the gate to take judgment. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things you can read throughout. And, and he's there to hear the case, but he also appeals, um, you notice in three, see your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. And they, kind of the plot thickens there because he already takes sides with him. Yep. He automatically says, hey, you know what you have to say. And he forgets the whole proverb eighteen seventeen: The first man to speak seems right. Mm-hmm. And because he's not concerned about justice, he's not concerned about making judgment. He is concerned about power, if you will, as you had mm-hmm. said, and, and undermining what the Lord has given and undermining his father. And then when we do see that, it, it does go on. Uh, well, I would give you justice, and and he does. He even we talked about the kiss before with David kissing him. He's now greeting them with a kiss as one who is either a brother or have peace with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that is that is fascinating, right? Like in, in verse five. I mean, this I think kind of helps break down what what this kiss means, right? You know, we. I mean, we saw this last time a little bit, um, and we briefly made the comparison to to the Lord and the disciples. But I mean, I think we gotta we gotta look at what exactly this kiss entails. Um, we gotta take our break though, but we'll we'll get back to this when we uh, uh, just after a little pause here, everybody. We're looking at Second Samuel fifteen on Nice Strong Word. We'll be right back.
51 years of proclaiming the good news of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. We, the people of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, invite you to join us for worship on Sunday morning at 9 or 1030. We are located in Arnold, Missouri at 2211 Tenbrook Road. Come and listen to the voice of Jesus the Good Shepherd on the web at goodshepherdarnold.org. Friday on Issues Etc., we'll talk with Dr. Steven Kayser about a New York Times column on pro-life Christians. We'll discuss constructive things to do and pray while waiting for election results with Joy Pullman, and we'll play Issues Etc. Soundbite of the Week. Listen and vote in advance at facebook.com slash issues etc. Issues Etc. Live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. November is not the sunniest or cheeriest month for most people, but even as days get noticeably shorter, the human heart still has reasons to sing. Hope and love, for example. Sing for Joy, heard here each week, finds those reasons and more and invites you to listen. I hope you will. Sundays at noon on KFUO. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 15 here, the conspiracy of Absalom. Joined today by our guest, Pastor Brian Thiem, pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Columbia, Missouri. If you've got a question for me or Pastor Thiem, give us a call if you're listening live, 1-800-730-2727, or if you're in St. Louis, 314-821-0850. You can also send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or hop on the live stream at facebook.com slash H.A. Espinosa. A couple of questions there already. Uh, the one that we'll want to take a look at in a minute here is, you know, so what's David doing while Absalom's building this rebellion uh, over, you know, four years here, right? Shouldn't he realize that uh, there aren't as many people coming to him? Or does he think he's uh, maybe successfully delegated this? To Absalom. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I hope we can get to that in just a second. Um, before we get to some of these uh, good questions here, I want to make sure I thank our underwriters at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, lhfmissions.org. Thank you guys for supporting Thy Strong Word. All right. So uh, right before the break, we were looking at, 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 this, uh, at this KISS thing here, right? Because, um, y- you know, certainly there is a, uh, you know, in the New Testament, we, we read kind of a little bit of this uh, kiss of peace thing that's going on that, that seems to be, um, well, I mean, it seems to be the precursor to what is done in actually a lot of uh, European and Latin American societies even to this day, right, where um, it's like a kiss between uh, equals um, going, going back to the, that, that brotherhood, um, uh, the family of Christ and the household of faith. But here, I mean, it seems to be more than that, right? That it seems to be um, more more like the. I mean, I, I don't know if it would have been quite like this, but like you kind of think about like art and uh, and media depictions, right? Where like there's like the king like holding out his hand and and like the and the uh, the supplicant or the, the servant, right? You know, kisses his his hand or his ring or something like that. I mean, I, I think that this kiss here, and also the one in the previous chapter, um, maybe has more of that kind of connotation. What, what, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts on this in verse 5? Well, I think verse 5 itself helps us. It says, and whenever a man came near to pay homage, and that is a, a bowing down, a prostrating themselves. Before... Absalom. Well, what did he do? He put his hand out, and he took hold of him. So you're, you're bowing down and hoping for judgment in your favor, and I'm going to take hold of you and, and show you that, no, you belong with me, and, and we belong together, and, and we'll, we'll get through this, and we'll have peace here. Of course, it comes at a cost, because this is actually a, even though he's kissing peace with him, it is a, a kiss of betrayal to his father and in truth betrayal to those people because it is a false it's a false peace it's a false uh promise that comes with it yeah no it's uh 
it, it, it's it's fascinating here, right? I mean, like 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 you were saying, he's he's really just he, he's he's perverting justice too. Um, so I mean that, I mean, there's probably like a couple different headings that we could uh, put that under in terms of like the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, right? Um, but yeah, he's just saying like, oh yeah, yeah, then, you know that's right. You're totally in the right there. Uh, yeah, but, you know we got to do something about that. So he's just he's really just kind of. I mean, it's kind of like a political bribe, basically, right? Because everyone's coming to him, and it's just like, hey, guys, like, if you go to Absalom, like, you know, he's got this big bag of candy, and he'll just <laughs> give you whatever whatever you want, right? And so, I mean, just this kind of process of just doing favors, right? Especially um, if maybe they had a case, think about that, right? Like, if, if they were in the wrong, right? Or if they had a case that was a long shot, you know, and David being so equitable you know might not have given them something in their favor this is just starting to like get all kinds of people thinking man maybe we would be better off with absalom right and i and i you can see where that's the reason their hearts were stolen by him and we know that's what he's doing you can see this on a small scale um, both the authority and the winning over etc in a household in a household if you if the children are the ones running the household instead of the father, the one who has been given the authority, what happens to the household? There's chaos, and there's manipulation, and you can watch that, and you can go to the therapy sessions and hear about those things in a family. Well, this is just on a larger scale. This is a much larger scale, on a nation scale, where there is authority being taken. There's manipulation. The child is, is ready to run the household and with the rules. So, yeah, yeah, no, no. And, uh, I, I think, so this is, this is kind of an interesting thing in the text to get sorted out a little bit, but the, the idea of, you know, so the father is supposed to be managing the household, but here Absalom's just going and just stepping in. Right. Um, mm-hmm. in verse five, you have this, this construction that's like, so it says, you know, you know, it's something like, you know, and, and whenever it, and whenever it happened that someone came to to pay him homage, and, and then it like says like what he would do, and, and what's fascinating about that, right, is it's like, hang on a second, pay homage to whom, right? Because um, it it would kind of be surprising in some ways if we were talking about Absalom, right? So I, I think that when you look back in verse uh, two, and this, you see, there's like a little bit of like textual variation uh you know corruption it seems like it's meant to be a parallel verse though so you have you know and whenever it was that a man had a dispute um to bring before the king for judgment and then in verse five then similarly whenever someone would come to uh pay homage to him again referring to the king so it's like there's people going to david and and Absalom's just like grabbing them and pulling them aside and be like, no, over here. Um, and, and that's that's really, I mean, it's that's that's quite the image, right? It's like here comes this guy who's who's on his way to bow down to David, and and Absalom's literally just you know like yanking him, right, pulling him aside with this with this treacherous kiss. I mean, it's uh, oh man. I mean, I'm just, I mean, just that idea, like you were just saying, like, you know, like there, there's this one man that's been appointed by God to, to oversee these things. And Absalom's already like with some violence, just like, yeah, trying to yank it away from him. Yeah. And we, we see Absalom earlier on. What you notice was he would go out early in the morning. He had this big show, but it also yeah. says that Absalom would call out. He would cry out. He would proclaim. So he was yelling after him. And then, Oh, yep. oh, this is this is the king's son, that good-looking guy. Look at him, and uh, he's here, and and then that's when they would pull him in, and he, he yeah. pulls other people in. We we see later on where two hundred innocent go along. <laughs> They're getting pulled in, and yeah, no, that's right. That, that's that's how the devil works, though. You know, pull them in, deceive them. Even no, you yeah. usually don't know that's happening. That's right. No, no. I, I, okay, I really appreciate that. Let's let's take a look at uh, at, at that verse too, right? So it was, um, where was it? The, the two, the two hundred, right? 
Um, right. Let me see. Here. That's when it he's in... going to. He asked permission. It's in verse uh, um, eleven. There, 11. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, that's right. Yeah, no. So this, so this is just fascinating, right? So, so there he goes, right? And he's like asking Dad, you know, to, if he can go, you know, pay, uh, you know, pay this vow, right? Um, you know, and so his father's like, well, of course, you know, I'm going to let my son, you know, like, you know, worship God and all, and all piety. But I mean, this is, this is just so devious, right? He goes, he goes to Hebron, right? Which is significant because that's where his father was anointed, <laughs> right? That's, that's where yeah. David was anointed to be king over, over Judah. And so he's going back there, right? Um, and, and, and it's just, I mean, su- such a provocative way, like you were saying too, like, you know, he takes these men who don't even realize they're 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 party to this right and i I mean he's just uh just pulling the rug right out from underneath his father and and um part of that though is he's pulling the rug out of his father although and this is a plot and a plan because he's been doing this for four years yeah yeah right and and so he's doing it for years he is going to hebron hebron has the patriarchs there, what Abraham and Sarah are buried there, Isaac and Rebecca are buried there, Jacob yeah. and Leah are buried there, right? We have all them that are buried there. We have, well, Absalom was also born in Hebron, and it is one mm-hmm. of the places that David was anointed. So I think that you can see in some, uh, where they'll talk about the word trap. They, they, they have words of kindness, and it's a trap. If you remember from Oh, what was that? The the bear in Othello. That's what he did. Mm. Too. You can see in the same character in Othello. Uh, it was Iago. Is that how it's pronounced? I can't. I think that's how oh it's Iago. Called. Yeah, uh, Iago. Yeah, Iago was the same way. Uh, he he absolutely hates Othello. Yeah, but he plotted to destroy destroy him, and he does it. He he has kind words. He has all this. He's known that, but underneath yeah. is a it's a facade on the outside, which is what we can see with Absalom himself. Wonderfully looking on the outside, but rotten to the core. Well, the core and, 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 and so, okay, so a- Absalom, you know, just, I guess, I guess it gets to the question here. I mean, so Absalom is fooling a lot of people, right? I mean, he's, right. he's fooling the people who are, are coming and he's saying like, oh, well, you know, actually David doesn't really have anything for you today, but, but you know, I, I, I'm here. Right or you know he he pulls in these two hundred. I mean, so he's just uh, pulling the wool over people's eyes. Is that what he's been doing for four years to his father? I mean, why doesn't David? You know, this is the question on Facebook. Why doesn't David like catch on to this? Right. I mean, it's so interesting because just in the previous chapter, Joab gets that wise woman from Tekoa, disguises mm-hmm. her and all this, and like you know he, she's going along and doing the song and dance, and after a while, David's like. Did Joab put you up to this? I mean, I mean, like David's smart, you know. I mean, he's he's not one to get get duped. We've, we've just seen kind of like cunning and uh, wisdom from him at every turn. Like, what what does he think Absalom's doing all this time? Why is he Why does he just fall for this? Well, I think uh, what's Absalom doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. Yeah. I, first of all, I mean, it's natural that you love your, your children. That's part of what yeah. God has given us. But also David, I mean, I think uh, part of the thing with David is you have to remember that ever since Moses, you still didn't do all of the judging. You had those under you that would do it, too. There was only certain cases that would actually make it all the way to the king. Uh, yeah. Moses wasn't a king, but still. Uh, and the same thing with the king. There are only certain ones would make it. Plus... If I remember right, it's been a while, but I think this is about the time that David is very busy building his palace, and it takes about four years to build his palace during mm. that, and uh, he may well have been caught up with that yeah. at the time. And, and instead of doing what he should do, hey, let's look at what tapestry should be hanging over here. <clears throat> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that, that, we, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point, right? I mean, which... Which uh, I mean, I mean, it's so ironic, right? So if you just kind of imagine this, you know, David is is uh, you know building this palace and is so preoccupied with his palace, right, that uh, he doesn't realize <laughs> that he's building the palace for someone else to rule there, right? I mean, and, and how often do we do that, right? Like we, uh, you know, we start counting our uh, chickens before they hatch, right? And uh, right. 
you know i I mean so so yeah no so that that's a great irony i think um and and then to your point too about like the delegation right i mean uh that that's right i mean I, i think that certainly if david found out that okay absalom was (laughs) Uh, the the way that he was doing this, right? He was like, you know, you know, saying, oh, well, you know, David doesn't have anything for you, but, you know, but hey, you know, I do. And, you know, uh, too bad that I'm not, you know, the one who's making all these dis- decisions, right? I mean, if he had if he had known that, okay, that would have been problematic. But, I mean, I think you're right. Like, just kind of the, from the outside looking in, if he just sees like, oh, hey, look at that. Absalom's, you know, like, uh, you know, take, taking an interest in, in governing, right? You know, and, you know, he's taken on some of the load here and, uh, t- you know, playing a more active role in the House of David. I mean, I, I mean, it would have been natural for a father to be proud of him even, mm-hmm. right? Like, oh, look at that. He's, you know, supporting the, supporting the kingdom and, you know, uh, preparing to, you know, take over one day, right? I mean, just... You got you got to sympathize with how easy it would have been for David to get suckered into that, even as wise as he was. I mean, like we all have a soft spot for our kids, right? Well, and it is natural that we are, like I said, to love love our children. That's what God has given it to us is to to love our family, love those around us, love our children. And so that soft spot is there. It's just we can't be like Eli who overlooked his sons and their mm-hmm. and and the evils they had committed. And sometimes we do that, but yeah, I, I think um, so. Um, we had some questions come in over email uh, that yeah. we if we take a look at here. So, um, so yeah, so this is interesting here. So, Pastor, when I read this, I thought about a song, "Cats in the Cradle." Uh, the song, the, the son is mm-hmm. neglected by the father and pledges to be like him when he grows up. He's just like him. And he neglects his father. Uh, yeah, you know that there's, there, there's certainly some irony, and uh, I, I mean, I mean, you know, and tragic irony in the process of this. So, okay, so I guess that was kind of the lead up to the question here. So, um, Absalom sought the peace of his father and the matter of his sister. He was saddened at his uh, non-response. Is, is that why he rebelled? Is this rebellion kind of all going back to ultimately that David would not give Tamar? justice um that's that's an interesting question i mean i i think that i i think you kind of got to read it that way to a at least to an extent right that you know absalom is i mean isn't that fascinating like we actually didn't even really look look at this a couple chapters ago right but it says that uh, absalom just kind of bides his time for like two years before he right. takes revenge on Amnon, right? I mean, there is revenge a dish served cold, right? I mean, so, I, I mean, it, it certainly feels like that way to me, that, that Absalom's just, like, just plotting and taking his time and is not forgetting or letting go of any of this. What, what do you think? Well, he's certainly known for being patient and plotting, yeah. Yeah. And, and we can see that. And, but is this the reason? I can't answer that you know, uh, exactly per se. It can certainly add to it because he does say, um, I would give you justice. There's no one to give you justice here. And he may well have felt that way when it came to his father. So those words may have been heartfelt for him, but. Yeah, no, that's a good point, right? Like the whole, uh, I would give you justice, right? I mean, Ooh, (laughs) wow. Um, you know, how many times has, I mean, did he, did he say that even to his sister? Right. And and I I mentioned it just briefly in passing. Right. But, uh, we see that Absalom had a a daughter, uh, whom he named Tamar, right? Like, you know, after his sister. Right. I mean, so you look at like little details like that and it's just sort of like, wow. Okay. I, I mean, clearly Absalom was, was deeply hurt about this. Um, and, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it adds up anyway, even if uh, it isn't explicit. But oh man, when he when he says that, like, oh, <laughs> oh, that I were judge in the land, right? Yes. And I, I think you can see throughout this this kind of justice and not justice and that's going on. And which I think uh, when we get towards the end, which I hope we do, and talk about uh, David and Mount of Olives, because I think there's. Uh, an important parallel and some important things going on that we see connected with with 
the New Testament, um, and when and justice and justice being done. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and because uh, we were just looking here at um, you know some of these elements here. We, we talked a little bit about uh, you know verse eleven, the way that you know he was just kind of sucking people into this here. Um, I, I think that that maybe the the last thing that uh, I mean, it, it'll it'll come up again, right? But in verse twelve. We, we see mentioned here that Absalom, um, he's offering sacrifices and he sends for Ahithophel the Gilanite, right? And uh, th- th- this this might be significant later. But so um, it, I, I guess maybe, maybe because uh, we did kind of briefly touch on, you know, some of like the, the mixed bunch, right? And how, how David is, you know, wisely getting out before everyone in the palace gets slaughtered. He shows like compassion, right? So, I mean, there, there's a w- wisdom and compassion in all this here. But yeah, I, I think we should take a look here at what's going on at the end and some of these particular characters here, right? Um, what, what do you think is the significance as we're here getting to the end? You know, they, they, they go to the Mount of Olives. Um, they do have the Ark of the Covenant go with them initially, but then sends it back. And, and you've got... Zadok and Abiathar, and then this uh, this Ahithophel is mentioned, right? So, wh- what what do you make of these particular names of people and places? Well, as far as some of the the people in the places, or some of the people, anyways, and Zadok and the one of the things you notice here with the Ark of the Covenant coming to them, yeah, is in this chaos, it's like, well, grab the Ark and let's go, but. Yeah. What you're not going to have is David manipulating. No, we can't manipulate God here. If I should be here, I will be here. If not, then he will not have me come, and I will not be blessed by him. Um, Because he says, carry it back into the the city. If I find favor with the eyes of the Lord, I will bring, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place, his resting place. If he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let me do to me what seems good to him. So one of the things we see is, is not trying to manipulate God and his authority, much like Absalom is trying to manipulate his earthly father. God is, David is not going to try to manipulate his heavenly father. So we see that. Yeah, that, that's a great point. But, and I think, I think it's very timely, too, right? I mean, David's confronted with injustice, manipulation, right? So, you know, th- does he say, like, hey, you know what? Uh, I mean, and this whole thing is illegitimate. It, it's, uh, it's not legitimate. It's not legal that, you know, Absalom's doing this and, and taking these measures. And so you know, I'm, I'm going to fight it. And I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to take the Ark of the Covenant because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just not right. But, but no, he doesn't react that way. You know, he says— you know, if if it's God's will, I'll be back. <laughs> right? I, right? I mean, I wait, wait. That, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And I think that's where the Psalm 3, I do not rest in the hands of man, but I rest in the hands of the Lord. And and because he'll talk about in Psalm 3 being surrounded um, by those, but it's the Lord is the one who salvation belongs to. That's the blessing that comes from him. Yeah. And that's hard even in today. I mean, you look at, Oh, this great fun week that we're having right now. It, yeah, right. We're not in the hands of a of man or a woman. Right. We are not in the hands of the people of this world. We're not in the hands of the devil. We are the baptized children of God, and we belong to Him and in His hands. That's and right. uh, that's gone on for generations and uh, thousands of years. The even when the martyrs who were burned at the stakes, they I am not the hands of Nero. I'm being burned at the the stake. We will sing hymns. And we will give that witness there. Uh, absolutely. So, and, so yeah. So even like you're saying, like just in our own context, right? Where uh, I think I think you know everybody is is just very it's very easy for us to look and point at the other side and say, oh, like look what they're doing, and you know that's that's illegitimate, that's manipulative, all, all this, right? But the response of faith is not like, oh, well, we'll fight fire with fire then, right? But saying, you know what, um, if it's God's will. Uh, he will see to it that this injustice is is corrected in due time, right? And and, and that's that show, David does show a lot of grace, which is a helpful example for us here. But um, but but yeah, but what do you make then of some of these? Uh, so so that that's kind of the Ark of the Covenant here. But but right. going up, he he does though, right? Uh, take certain people 
along with him, right? So what, what do you what do you make of uh, the ones he says, you know, hey, you come with me, and the other ones who he says, hey, you stay back? Well, I think especially what we have is the um, the foreigners coming. Uh, the ones that are already in exile are going into exile. And yeah. uh, some of the God's people, along with the foreigners, are going into the wilderness, and they wait for God to bring them back, if that is so. Um, I think there is, yeah, I mean, certainly you have some of the intrigue of the spy and so on. But yeah. he also prays that the, the Lord would show him steadfast love and, and mercy and faithfulness to them if they come or they go. And we again find the foreigners are the ones who, who remain faithful. But I think that if you don't mind, I, I wouldn't mind going to talk about David in the Mount of Olives. Yeah, they're in and verse they're 30, reading. right? Weeping and, as yeah, he went barefoot. And I think that's, that becomes important for a couple reasons. So you have David who ascends the Mount of Olives. He, he mm -hmm. comes out of the, the city. He goes down and across the Kidron Valley. He goes up the Mount of Olives with the, the people. And he goes weeping and barefoot. And he covers his head because that's a, a sign of shame. There has been a, a treason against him. And I, I guess the reason that I want to make sure we get to this is because we bring this up when we talk about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right. And, and the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Gethsemane meaning that olive press that's mm -hmm. on the Mount of Olives, kind of down more towards the, the valley. And, and in particular there, so here you have David escaping. But when you get to Jesus, he's there. And if you've ever been there, you can see the city walls. Mm -hmm. And John tells us that the officers came and others came and the guards, Judas, etc., and they had their torches and their hand lured lanterns. There is no way that Jesus would not have seen, looking up at the city, hmm. he would not have seen those torches coming and those lights. It's night. He would have hmm. seen them come. And he could have done as his ancestors, human ancestor had done, David, and escaped over the Mount of Olives. And, and left back into the wilderness. But if he did that, uh, that would have left us in this wilderness of this fallen world. Yeah. And, and I think in particular what we have here is it gives us an understanding that Jesus is a willing sacrifice. When it talks about that, he could escape like, his, like David, but he doesn't. He sees them coming and he waits. And... In, in a way, he's answering what David had said. You know, if if the Lord will have me come to that resting place, then it will be. And in this case, though, he calls more than David back. He ends up calling us all back. And I think that's such a, a beautiful picture when you get to that New Testament, is to understand David and escaping Absalom in that same spot that Jesus does not escape but remains. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think that pairs nicely too, just with the, the stuff we said about you know the, the 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 kisses, right, and how kisses are being used for the purposes of betrayal with Ooh. Judas, um, and then even the mention of Ahithophel, right, who is related to Bathsheba. So you know, do you have like a counselor back there in the city who's uh, basically just there holding a grudge, right, which is not too unlike even the high priests who weren't interested in necessarily giving the Lord justice, but just didn't like him, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think all those things tie together, and you see, like, a really powerful, as you've been describing, uh, foreshadowing of uh, the Lord and uh, in his betrayal, who is, who is actually innocent, right? Uh, versus Absolutely. here in David and Absalom, and, and David, uh, although this is uh, still wrong, you know, certainly failing and not without sin. So... A lot, a lot of good things, brother. You helped us unpack today. Thank you very much, and God bless you and uh, all yours there in Columbia, Missouri. Well, and thank you, and peace be with you. Thank you, brother. Everybody, Pastor Brian Theme, Trinity, Columbia, Missouri, going on to the next chapter in Second Samuel here, everybody. Till then, I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. Peace. Of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.